Good morning. Is it live or?
Good morning. Happy Palm Sunday, everyone. Let's worship our King together.
Right, let's give these kiddos a round of applause this morning. You can go ahead and have a seat. You can go ahead and have a seat this morning. I don't know about you, but my arms are tired just watching these kids this morning. That was impressive. That surely was. But happy Palm Sunday to each and every one of you this morning, and good morning, and welcome to Welfare Baptist Church. Today is Palm Sunday, and so I hope this morning that you are reminded about our Savior entering into Jerusalem knowing what was ahead of him. In just a matter of of days, Jesus knew the cross was before him. And the same people that were crying out, Hosanna, were also some of the same people that were saying just days later, crucify him, crucify him. But today we lift up the name of Jesus and we say amen and Hosanna to our King and to our Savior this morning. If you are a first-time guest with us this morning, we're so glad that you're here. You could be anywhere else, but God has you here and each and every one of us here this morning. If you are a first-time guest, we want to welcome you. We also ask, there's a little connection card in the pew in front of you that looks like this. We ask if you would please fill that out. There will also be a QR code on the screen behind me this morning. that You can also fill out that very same form through your phone as well. We also want to ask if you're a member of this church or you're a regular attendee, we want to encourage you and invite you to take your next step this morning. In whatever way God is calling you to take that next step, maybe it's baptism, maybe it's joining this family here at Welfare Baptist, whatever it may be, we want to encourage you to be bold and to take that next step this morning. Well, before we stand up and greet one another, I want to remind you of one other important thing. Today is Palm Sunday, so that means next week is... Easter, all right? And more people uh, who are not normally open to coming to church on a regular Sunday are more open to coming to church on Easter Sunday. And so in the hallways and as you leave this morning, you may see a little door hanger like this. I want to encourage you this morning to go into your neighborhood, go into your workspace, and maybe just hang one of these door hangers on a doorknob in your neighborhood or at your office or wherever God is calling you to place one of these. I told our students this past week, as we distributed these door hangers, that there may be one person or there may be many people that step foot in this space into God's house at Welfare Baptist Church simply because they got one of these. And they may hear the gospel for the very first time. And you never know the way in which God is going to work through people who are obedient to him and through a simple door hanger. So I want to encourage you this morning, if you haven't passed these out in your neighborhood, I would encourage you to. Don't go soliciting, just put it on the doorknob and move on. But I want to encourage you to grab one of these as you leave today and invite many to come to be a part of what God is going to do here next week. We believe it's going to be something really special. So as we continue on our, our worship this morning, let's all stand and let's greet one another this morning.
exalted in his temple as symphonies of angels praise now strain to sound his glory come worship fall before his grace the king in all his beauty how so many parts to the equation we look for you know creative ways to you know meet needs I'm really passionate about gifting essential products but it's the importance of leaving the pews and going out and being the light and love of Jesus we have volunteers within our churches we're creating you know earrings and bracelets to then use those for our street outreach we can um, just bless um, women that are in strip clubs or on the street. And the goal is just really that the loss will be reached with the love of Christ. When people give to the Annie Armstrong offering, uh, individuals are receiving Christ and realizing their beloved identities as beloved sons and daughters. Your generous support is going towards so many individuals who do not have a relationship with Jesus, helping them realize that they are loved and loved by Christ. Amen. 
Well, we've got two Sundays left here for our Annie Armstrong Easter offering. And so I just want to encourage you to continue to be faithful to give to that. We're about $2,500 shy of our goal at this point. So we've got two Sundays to make it. I believe that we can do it. But do you see in videos like these that every single dollar that we give towards Annie Armstrong goes directly towards planning churches and getting the gospel to underreached areas of our own nation and Canada. So this uh, for North American missions is what this offering is for. So I want to encourage you, pray about what God would lead you to give so that we can get the gospel where it has not yet been, whether it's across the street or around the globe. Man, we want to be all about being a church that makes disciples who make disciples. Amen? Amen. Well, speaking of that, let me just share with you some exciting things going on in our midst right now. All right. So I don't know if you all remember or not, but we talked about this uh, last fall. We said we would know as we were looking in Genesis and said the calling to be fruitful and multiply. Right. God told us that in in uh, in Genesis uh, one and two. He, He called us to this and we said we would know that we are growing in our healthiness as a church when we see a full baptistry and a full nursery. Well, church, just the other Sunday, we saw a pretty full baptistry, didn't we? We give God praise. Yeah, you can give God praise for that. That's awesome. (laughs) Guess what? It's already filling back up. We've already got, I think, four people who are now saying they are ready to be baptized. So give God praise for that, right? Man, that's awesome. But then I also got stopped the other week, and I was told, "Uh, Ricky, uh, we need to buy more cribs. Our nursery is blowing up right now, right? So give God praise for that, too. We love it. We love seeing new people coming in our midst. Even just over the last couple weeks, we've seen 240-plus people here on a given Sunday. I mean, y'all, praise God for that. Amen? We rejoice in that. Not because of the number, by the way, but because we know each, of the, each number there represents a person. Amen? And we want to reach our community with the good news of Jesus Christ. But let me tell you another way that God has been blessing us. This is unbelievable, y'all. It's been in your generosity in giving. Man, we have just been blown away by what God is doing, even in our midst financially, to the point where we are not only meeting budget, we are in our giving, but we are also, we have a surplus now because of your generosity and your giving. And I just want to encourage you, don't hold back at this point, all right? Keep doing it, because let me tell you what's exciting about this. When we give, then we are able to do even more to do the Great Commission, right? To make disciples who make disciples. So I want you to know that your staff and and your your property and space committee and your, your uh, your budget and finance committee, we've all been meeting and we've been praying to say, man, God has so richly blessed us here. How do we best utilize these to get the gospel right, to get the gospel out, to to, to further the Great Commission. And so first and foremost, we said, you know what, God has blessed us in such an inordinate way that we don't believe he's just blessed us so that we can hoard a blessing, right? We want to be blessed to be a blessing. And so we said, how can this help us further in our Great Commission efforts? So first of all, we said, let's use some of these additional funds to establishing a North American partnership, all right? So we're praying about what that's going to look like and where that's going to be, but y'all be praying in that way as well as we set aside some funds there to be able to do that. We're also going to be able to bless some local Great Commission ministries right in our backyard that we partner with. So ministries like Breaking Bread for Jesus and ministries like Evans Training Center which some of us just got to witness a graduation ceremony there the other day. Beautiful thing to see lives transformed by the gospel there. So your gifts are making that possible. It's also allowing us to make sure that we have a healthy reserve on hand to make sure that we can sustain when we don't have a surplus, right? But we we praise God that we currently do. But it's also allowing us, again, in conjunction with those committees to say, hey, what are some much needed repairs and some other things to get us ready for the future around here that we can make those best use for because that is a great commission effort as well as we get our place ready for us to continue to make disciples who make disciples. Amen? Can we give God praise for his faithfulness? Man. He's so good. So as we prepare our hearts to give this morning, let's continue to give to our regular budget and offering, but let's also pray how we can give above and beyond so that we can reach our nation and the rest of North America and the nations with the good news of King Jesus. Amen? So let's give to our regular offering. Let's give to Annie Armstrong this morning. Let's pray together. Father, thanks so much for this day. 
Thank you for your faithfulness in what you're doing among your people. God, we rejoice and we give thanks that you are saving people. You are calling people out of darkness and into your marvelous light. God, you're adding to our number. You are adding disciples in our midst so that we can continue to make disciples. And Jesus, we just give you thanks. We give you praise for that. Thank you for your many blessings. God, you have just gone above and beyond. We just see the fruit of what you are doing in and through your word and in and through your people as we seek to grow as disciples and make disciples. So Lord Jesus, free us up to be even more generous with, the, with whatever you've given us so that we can do what you've called us to do, so that we can adore, align, and advance together. It's in the name of King Jesus we pray. Amen. Good morning again, church. Let's turn in our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to wrap up Ephesians chapter 2 this morning, starting in verse 19. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. Well, if you were in a church youth group back in the 90s, count yourself blessed because you lived during the age of peak CCM. I am talking about some contemporary Christian music. So you could go on a great adventure with Stephen Curtis Chapman. You could find your place in this world with Michael W. Smith. You could even have breakfast and shine with the OG newsboys. You could become a bus driver with Cademan's Call, survive a flood with jars of clay, You could stomp with Kirk Franklin and, of course, learn the art of being a Jesus freak with DC Talk. Yeah, that's right. That's so good. That's good. Your youth leaders might have even forced you to do an interpretive movement or two to the latest Cheeseball Carmen song. I'm going to have to plead the fifth on that one, but... Suffice to say, I'm glad social media did not exist in my day. But you know, there was one song from the 90s that captured the hearts of a generation and became a staple in youth groups well past its prime. And I bet all you need is a little bit of that guitar intro and it'll bring back all those summer camp vibes. I'm talking about do 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 ba doop do 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 Y'all know what I'm talking about. do 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 Man, doesn't that just beckon to you? Calling you to contemplate those epistemological uncertainties like, I don't know where you lay your head or where you call your home. I don't know where you eat your meals or where you talk on the phone. I don't know if you got to cook a butler or a maid. I don't know if you got a yard with a hammock in the shade. Sing it with me. <laughs> Come and go with me to my father's house. Come and go with me to my father's house. It's a big, big house. With lots and lots of room, a big, big table with lots and lots of food, a big, big yard where we can play football, a big, big house. It's my father's house. Ba ba do ba do ba ba da. Yeah, y'all give yourselves a round of applause. Y'all sounded awesome. That was that was fantastic. But I mean, y'all. I know that that is straight cheese, but come on. 
Come on, that cheese is straight up delicious, all right? It's a fun song, it's a great song, but you know, I especially love the second verse, and no, we're not going to sing that one this morning, but just listen to the words that it says. It says, all I know is a big old house with rooms for everyone. All I know is lots of land where we can play and run. All I know is you need love, and I've got a family. All I know is you're all alone, so why not come with me? Again, I know. A little cheesy but y'all it's true and maybe it's talking about you maybe you came into this place this morning needing some love looking for a place to belong and can I just tell you something look no further in fact look around you because we were once just like you but now we're family and our father's house is big enough that there's room enough for even you So why not come with me? That's exactly what Paul is inviting the Ephesians into in our passage this morning. Because remember, as Gentiles, they were once on the outside. They were the uncircumcised, which meant they were not part of God's covenant with the Israelites, which meant they were ineligible for his blessing and salvation because they were not his people. They were not his family. They were not citizens of Israel. Therefore, Paul said in verse 12 that they were without hope. Because they were without God. But then Paul showed us that many Jews were in the same predicament. Because even though they were close in proximity to God, many of them still did not know God. And for these Jews, their circumcision was merely a way for them to look holy on the outside while they were still unholy on the inside. So it turned out simply being a descendant of Abraham did not make one an heir to God's promise or a true member of Israel. Because the promise we all have is way more than skin deep. We can't be saved by simply making an outward change, an outward circumcision. No, we need a heart change. We need an inward circumcision. So how then do both Jew and Gentile find their way into the chosen people of Israel, becoming true descendants of Abraham and therefore heirs according to the promise? Well, we've seen throughout Ephesians, the only way in is through Christ. 2.13 said, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near. 2.18 says, for through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. And that's why in verse 19 this morning, Paul can now say this to a bunch of formerly pagan Gentiles, people far from God, people on the outside, people estranged from the covenant promises. He says, because you are now in Christ, listen, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but what? You are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. In other words, the once homeless now have a home. Why? Because if you are in Christ, if he is the head and you are part of his body, everything that he has accomplished is now true for you. That's why Paul can say that even though you were born a Gentile, you are now a fellow citizen with the saints. And who are the saints here? Well, you know, some people tend to view saints as superhumans with halos that we pray to because they're closer to God. But listen, that's not taught anywhere in the Bible. Instead, we see that the saints, which literally means holy ones, refers to anyone who has placed their hope and their faith in the one true God. That means if your faith is in Jesus Christ this morning, get get this, you are a saint. So Paul here is referring to all who have put their faith in Christ throughout history. In particular, he's referring to the saints of old, those Israelites in the Old Testament who were not just circumcised on the outside, but also on the inside because their hope was in Christ. But wait, you might be thinking, how could their hope be in Christ when they never lived to see Christ because their hope was in the promise God made to Abraham and to David that Christ would come? So they were looking forward to Christ and what he would accomplish, even as we now look back on what Christ has already accomplished and look forward to him returning one day. But even they, even they were saved by grace through faith in God's promise of a coming Messiah. 
And in the same way, all the Jews of Paul's day who believe on the Lord Jesus prove themselves true citizens of the kingdom and heirs to Abraham's promise. Why? Because they recognized Jesus was the Messiah and they put their faith in him and followed him. And now, now Paul tells these uncircumcised Gentiles that they too are members of Israel. Why? Because by faith, they are now in Christ and he fulfilled the law on their behalf, tearing down that wall of hostility between Jew and Gentile. That's why there's no longer a need for circumcision. Why? Because the covenant promise has been fulfilled, and there's no more need for sacrifice because the blood of lambs and bulls could never take away sin. They were just meant to point forward to Jesus, the Lamb of God who does take away our sin. And there's no longer a need for distinction between clean and unclean, because in Christ, all creation is being made clean. And because Because of all this, that also means there is no longer a need for distinction between Jew and Gentile. Why? Because again, if you are in Christ, he has fulfilled every aspect of the law on your behalf. That means because he was a member of Israel, you are now a member of Israel. And because he is the heir according to the promise, you are now an heir according to the promise. And because he is one with the Father, you are now reconciled to the Father. That's why Paul could say the prophecy from Hosea was now fulfilled. This prophecy said, those who were not my people, I will call my people. And her who was not my beloved, I will call beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. Listen, because you are now in Christ, you are now his people. Friend, you belong here, not by works. Not by birthright, because again, you weren't a Jew, but by grace through faith, you have now been grafted in. So you who were once a stranger and an alien now have been brought into the fold and made a citizen. Isn't that glorious? By the way, this is why historically speaking, Christians have had a heart for strangers and aliens, for those who are immigrants and refugees, because that's who we once were in a spiritual sense. And it's who Israel once was in a literal sense, both when they lived as foreigners in Egypt and when they were scattered among the nations while they were in exile. That's why God commanded Israel this in Leviticus 19, 33. He said, when a stranger sojourns with you in your land, you shall not do him wrong. You shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you as the native among you, and you shall love him as yourself, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Now listen, Christians can have all sorts of opinions of how to handle immigration, That's not the issue here. And certainly nations have a right to secure their border in order to protect their citizens. But listen, regardless of our opinions about immigration policy, what's not debatable is our call to love immigrants, to act and speak kindly and compassionately towards them. Because first of all, they are image bearers just like us, made by a holy God who loves them. So beware anyone who speaks of them in less than human terms. But second, second, we are called to reach them with the gospel that they might also become our brother and sister in Christ, if they are not already, and a fellow citizen of the kingdom of God. After all, Christ himself was once a stranger in a foreign land when he and his family had to flee the violence of Herod and settle in Egypt when Jesus was a baby. And here he says the church itself is a people made up of former strangers and aliens. But how have we been, but now we have been made citizens with a hope in a future, not because of anything we've done, but because of what he's done. Because again, it's not by works we have been saved, but by grace through faith. But church, it gets even better than this, because not only has God welcomed us into the kingdom, making both Jew and Gentile descendants of Abraham, it says that we have also been made members of his household. Indeed, as Paul told us in 1.5, he has adopted us as sons, making us co-heirs with Christ, guaranteeing for us through the Holy Spirit an everlasting inheritance, as 1.14 says. In other words, he's invited us into that big old house 
to live and to dwell with him. And my friend, again, there's room in that house for you. But it gets even better than this because Paul begins to shift the metaphor, showing that we are not only members of the family, but as a church, as a people that God is bringing together from formerly warring tribes, God is actually building a house according to an intentional design he's had for all eternity. And that house, Paul says, is what? Verse 20, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. So not only are the once homeless now having a home, but we see the once hopeless now have a strong foundation. Now, most of us know that the foundation is the most important part of a building. You can have the most beautiful home up top, but if there's not a strong foundation in due time, what's going to happen? That thing's going to crumble to the ground. But here, Paul shows us the surety of our foundation by telling us that our house is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Now, who were the apostles and the prophets? These were the people who received revelation from God to proclaim truth from God to people everywhere, calling them to salvation. Indeed, the apostles were the 12 disciples and a few others like Paul who sat under the teaching of Jesus, who believed on and followed Jesus, and who were eyewitnesses to the resurrection, and whom Jesus entrusted with the gospel message and the establishment of the church. And Jesus promised these men that he would send his Holy Spirit to guide them in all truth. John 17, 8, Jesus explains, I have given them the words that God gave me, and they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from God, and they have believed that God sent me. And as they were grounded in the truth, John 17, 18 says, just as God sent his son into the world, so too was Jesus sending these men out into the world to proclaim the good news of the gospel, that while we were dead in our sins and deserved to die for our sins, Christ paid the penalty for our sin, dying in our place, and rose from the dead so that all who believe would no longer perish but have eternal life. These men were the heralds of the kingdom of God. They not only explained to us who Jesus was and what he had done for us and what we were to do in response, but they also rightly and authoritatively interpreted the Old Testament to demonstrate how everything was fulfilled in Jesus. And so God entrusted these men with the authority to guide the church in all truth. That's why every book of the New Testament was written by an apostle or under the supervision of an apostle. Indeed, Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to inspire them to write down the exact words without error that God wanted them to communicate in order to complete the canon of Scripture that we have today. And the words they wrote down, we are told, were breathed out by God. That is, they were inspired by God. They are the very word of God. It says they are profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Why? That the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. That's why in Acts 2 it says the early church devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. And it's what we do today. Church, that's why central to our gatherings as a church body is a focus on the word of God and specifically the gospel of Jesus Christ to which all scripture points and finds its fulfillment. Indeed, that's the only reason any of us are here this morning. As Paul told us earlier in 113, it's only when we heard the word of truth, the gospel of our salvation, and believed in him that we were then sealed in Christ with the promised Holy Spirit. Indeed, Paul has been very clear that none of us got into the church by our own merit. Again, we were strangers and aliens. Paul told us earlier that we were dead. So how did any of us get here? Because when we were dead, God made us alive. How? According to the purpose of his will, by God's grace, through faith. And even our faith is from him. So there's no room for boasting. But how did we come to faith? How did we come to believe? Well, Paul tells us in Romans 10, 17, he says, faith comes from hearing. And hearing through what? The word, the word of Christ. So we come to faith in God when the spirit of God awakens our hearts to desire God through the proclamation of the word of God written down by the apostles of God. Do you see then why Paul says that the apostles are the foundation of the church? It's because the church of Christ is built on the word of God. 
God's word is foundational for all we are and all we do. And our church is only going to flourish to the extent that we are standing on the word, living according to his word. The second that changes, we deserve to just come tumbling down because we've ripped away the only foundation on which we can stand, the truth of God revealed to the apostles of God. That's why the great reformer Martin Luther, when he was told to recant his preaching that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, under the threat of excommunication, exile, and even death, his words before the council were these, here I stand, I can do no other, God help me. Why? Because the foundation of the church is the word of God. It is what we build our lives on. It is what we build our teaching on. It is what we build our mission on. The apostolic message of the gospel of Jesus Christ is where we stand, church, and we can do no other. Even so, you might be surprised to find that Paul didn't say here that Christ is our foundation. (laughs) Isn't that what you're expecting? After all, we don't worship the apostles We worship Christ. Plus, Paul calls Christ the church's foundation in other passages of Scripture. So why doesn't he do that here? Here's why. Because Paul wants us to see that Christ is even more foundational than the foundation itself. Because if the testimony of the apostles, the gospel, is the foundation of the church, he says that means that Christ Jesus himself is what? The cornerstone. Now, When we talk about a cornerstone today, we often think of something like a ceremonial stone that has the date of construction or dedication like you might see on the outside of a church sanctuary or something. And sometimes we'll even put like a time capsule or something in there, right? And that's awesome. That's great. But listen, that's not what the cornerstone was in the ancient world. It wasn't just something pretty to look at. No, this was the most important stone in the entire building for that building's structural integrity. Indeed, in the ancient world, these stones could weigh upwards of 570 tons. 570 tons. Why? Because it was the basis on which the entire structure rested, bearing the weight of the entire building. But even more than that, it was the first stone that was put in place, and it thereby became the template by which the builder determined what other stones to utilize in the building, from the foundation on up through the walls and throughout the entire house. In other words, the cornerstone was the standard by which every line, every angle, every stone was determined. So if a stone was going to be in the house it had to be in alignment with the cornerstone and here Paul tells us when it comes to the church Christ is the cornerstone he is the foundation of the foundation the entire structure depends on him why because every single bit of our salvation depends on him one five we are adopted through Christ. 1-7, we have redemption in Christ. 1-11, we have obtained an inheritance in Christ. 1-13, we're saved how? By believing in Christ. 1-13, we are sealed in the Holy Spirit. Why? Because we are in Christ. 1-20, the power that is at work in Christ is now in us. 2-6, we are raised and seated with God in heaven in Christ. 2-13, we were far off but then brought near how? In Christ. 214, the dividing wall of hostility is broken down. How? In Christ. 218, we have access to the Father by the Spirit in Christ. 221 and 22, we are joined and built together in Christ. Are you starting to get the picture? No one gets in this building if they are not in Him. If they do not line up with him, and how does one begin to line up with him? Listen again, friends, not by our own merit. Again, left to ourselves, none of us is righteous. We would never measure up to the standards of God. The only thing our stone would be fit for is to be thrown into the sea. And yet, what did God do? Paul tells us that long before he made us, he chose us. He purposed in his heart to redeem us. He made us alive and saved us by his grace. And why was he able to do this? All because of 1-7. It says we are redeemed how? Through the blood of Christ. 
2.13 says we are brought near how? Again, by the blood of Christ. Friends, get this. This is the power of our cornerstone. While the typical builder would measure a stone against the cornerstone and cast it aside if it didn't measure up, our builder knew from the get-go that we could never measure up. And so he measured up for us. God's only son took on flesh became like us in every way except for one. He never sinned. And because he never sinned, because he fully obeyed the law of God, he was able to take the punishment and penalty that we deserve for our sin on the cross. See, Jesus didn't deserve to die, but he died in our place. And when he did, he not only bore the full wrath of God that we deserved, he also gave us all his righteousness, a righteousness we did not deserve. And in rising from the dead, he made this transaction and complete so that for all who don't measure up, which, spoiler alert, it's all of us, all right? If we turn from our sin and we believe in him and what he accomplished on the cross by his grace for his glory, friends, I'm here to tell you, we measure up. Isn't that good news this morning? But how is that possible? How does a stone go from not measuring up to measuring up? For one reason and one reason only, 2.10 says, we are his workmanship. See, left to ourselves, you could never take your stone and somehow measure up. Maybe you could chisel here or there, but the problem isn't that you have some rough edges. It's that you don't meet any of the requirements. You can't add to the stone. No, so you are powerless to help yourself. And if, but if you know Jesus this morning, I'm here to tell you, you know the maker of heaven and earth. And if he could make it all in the beginning, friend, he can make it all new again. And my friend, he can make you new again. In fact, he wants to. It's what he came to do. So will you let him? Will you let him bring you home? Because he's got a big house. And he wants you to be a part of it. Indeed, not only will he bring you home, in him we see finally this morning, the once godless now become God's home. Isn't that crazy? The once godless now become God's home. Check this out. This isn't just any building he's constructing here. What does it say? Verse 21, in Christ, the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Now, both Jew and Gentile would have immediately seen the significance of this. The Ephesians were famous for their temple to Artemis, which was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. The Jews, of course, had the temple to the real God, Yahweh. But both Jew and Gentile believed, and the Jews believed rightly, that their temples were where their God or gods dwelt among them. These were the places where they would come to meet with their God. Now, the Ephesian believers would have, of course, repented of their worship of Artemis and have ceased going to the temple because they were no longer followers of the pagan gods, but of the one true God. But listen, if worship of this one true God depended on going to the one physical temple to him, they were in big trouble. Why? Because they were still a long way off from the city of Jerusalem. Therefore, in this sense, they would have still been cut off from the presence of God. But Paul shockingly says here, no problem. Why? Because it turns out even that temple is now obsolete. Why? Because again, Jesus has already fulfilled the law. He's our once and for all sacrifice. He's our great high priest and mediator between God and man, unlike the human priests who were still sinners like us. He is our circumcision, and because of him, there is no longer clean or unclean, Jew or Gentile, because the wall of hostility has been torn down. So there is no longer a need for the temple. Why? Because the temple in the Old Testament was only meant to point forward to what God was ultimately going to do in the New Testament. See, it turns out he's too big to live in a cramped little temple made by man. Though he was faithful to manifest manifest the presence of his omnipresent self there in that place. But it was only to point to the greater reality that he was going to accomplish through Christ. Because get this, now you don't have to go to a place to be in the presence of God. If you are in Christ, the presence of God is now in you. 
Indeed, 1 Corinthians 3.16 says that we, we are the temple of God and that the Spirit dwells in us who believe. 1 Corinthians 6.19 therefore asks, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. Indeed, 1 Peter 2.5 points out that we ourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Church, do you see what's happening here? Church, we are now the temple of God. And I'm not talking about this building. I'm talking about the people. Where the people of God are, there the Spirit of God dwells. Indeed, Paul says so in verse 22. He says, in him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Now, when we hear the word you in the Bible, we often just think about ourselves as individuals. You, singular. But the you here is plural in Greek. So Paul is not talking about how the Spirit dwells in us as individuals, although other passages speak to that. But he's talking about how the Holy Spirit dwells in us as a people. This is yet another reason why church is not an option. Listen, if you want to encounter the presence of God, you need to be with the people of God. And how many of y'all believe that God is in this place this morning? Listen, I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt that he is. Why? Because his people are here. And where his people are, there his presence will be. This is God's design for the church. This is why you need the church and the church needs you. Following Jesus is not a solo sport. It is a team event because we're all a stone in this building. So when one of us is missing or is out of sync with the cornerstone, it affects us all. Because we are the temple, which means we have not only been reconciled to God, we are not only in Christ, but God now lives in us. We are his home. And get this, it's not like just a little bit of him is with us. No, there are two Greek words for temple in the Old Testament. There's hieron, which refers to the whole temple complex and its outer courts. But then there's the word naos. And naos refers to the inner temple the holy of holies, the place where the fullness of God's presence dwells. And guess guess which word is used here? Naos. Friends, do you see the significance of this? In the Old Testament, only the high priest could go in there and only once a year. But somehow now, because sinless Jesus died in your place, you not only get to go into that inner sanctum, church, you now are that inner sanctum. We are now that inner sanctum. That means this place that we are gathered in this morning is the holy of holies, the place the God's glory dwells. Not because there's anything special about this place, but listen, because there's something special about this people. Church, do you see the glory of this? We were dead. We were separated from God. We were cut off from his glory. We were cut off from his presence. We were alienated from his promises, strangers to his kingdom. And now that kingdom, those promises, that glory, that presence, the God of the very universe is here with us. He is here in us and he has made us his own church we are his temple do you see then why we are called to be holy as he is holy first of all because anyone who has experienced his grace has been transformed by his grace but second if we are his house if we are his temple how can we expect the holy presence of god to dwell among a people who continue in un holiness the truth is we can't that's why peter tells us it is time for judgment to begin at the household of god did you know that your sin doesn't just affect you no sin is ever private your sin is affecting your family your anger issues are affecting your kids. 
Your porn addiction is affecting your marriage. Your lack of self-control is wreaking havoc on those around you. Your seemingly personal sin is having drastic interpersonal consequences. And it's the same within the church. Because we're a family. So one member's sin affects us all. Christian, that's why we got to take our sin seriously this morning. Because it doesn't just affect you. One stone out of place in the building can have drastic effects on the entire structure. And there's only one way to remedy this. You can't try really hard to be a better stone in the structure. Although obedience to Christ is going to require you to take drastic measures of repentance. But no, you must first come to the cornerstone. Only he can bring you back into alignment. Only he can make you measure up. Only he can bring you home. Listen, only he can make us a temple fit for his presence to dwell. And church, that's all of our stories, amen? We were all far off, but he brought us home. He placed us on a solid rock, a sure foundation. He made us into his holy temple, the place where his glory dwells, where he walks among us, get this, just like he once did with Adam and Eve in the garden. He's restoring shalom. He's living among us again. And my friend, there's room for more. Because notice, it doesn't say that we have been joined together. It says we are being joined together. And it doesn't say that we have been built together. It says we are being built together. Indeed, it says that we are growing into a holy temple. In other words, church, y'all, we still under construction. There are more stones to be added. Friend, one of those stones could be you. And all you have to do is ask. Ask the builder to take your life and make you new, to align your heart with the heart of Christ, the cornerstone, and I promise you, he's going to do it. Because it's a big house, my friend, and there's room enough for you. So why not come with me? Why not come home? You don't have to stay a long way off. He can bring you home today. Ask him. Let's pray. Jesus, you are the cornerstone. We are your temple. So God, we ask this morning you'd purify your temple. God, whatever's going on in our hearts and in our lives this morning, God, thank you that if we are in Christ, we need not fear condemnation. All we have before us is restoration. So God, work in our hearts to surrender these things to you. For the good of our families, for the good of our neighbors, for the good of your church, but most importantly, for your glory. Because you're not just worthy of part of us, you're worthy of all of us. So God, in this place this morning, would you purify your people? And God, I just wanna pray for that person in here who might feel like an outcast, who feels far from you, who feels cut off from you, God, today, would you open their heart to see that there's room in your house for them, that they don't have to be far off. They can come near. They don't have to be a stranger. They can become family. They don't have to stay dead. They can be brought to life. Jesus, will you bring people to life this morning? Because you are the cornerstone. It all only happens through you. So do your work this morning, Jesus. Build your church. Purify your church. 
It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. I don't know what God's doing in your heart this morning, but again, he's told us judgment begins with the household of God. And that doesn't mean judgment like he's pouring out his wrath. Jesus already took the wrath. What does it mean? It means he is purifying his people. Isn't it good to know if you're in Christ, there is no more condemnation. There's only a chance to grow more and more like Christ. So whatever's going on in your heart and in your life this morning, we lay it down at the feet of Jesus. If you've yet to give your life to Christ, we would love for this to be the day that you would give your heart to Christ. So let's give our hearts to Christ this morning, church. Maybe in here you realize I need to be baptized. Let's be baptized. But whatever God is doing in your heart and in your life this morning, let's not ignore him. Let's stand, let's sing, and let's respond to God this morning.
some praise this morning. Man, God is on the move, amen? We're excited. Y'all can have a seat for just a second, because even as we talked about today, how we're growing into that temple, I'm excited to share with you that God is growing his temple this morning. He's, he's adding another to our number. And uh, Lily gave her life to Jesus last weekend at D-Now weekend, right? So are we excited about that or what, church? Come on up, Lily. So Lily is coming this morning to be baptized and to join our church and her awesome family. We love the Alzheimer's and th- this awesome family, this whole crew. Man, uh, we are just so thrilled to have them here and, and glad to have another one coming in the midst. So we're so excited. Lily has been here for a while, uh, but now she is officially part of the family and we're thrilled to have you here. We're excited that you're here, girl. That's awesome. Best decision of her life. Amen, church? Amen. Amen. We're excited how God's going to use you, grow you as a disciple, make disciples. So I'm going to invite you to stay up here, all right, and your family can join you in a second as well, and I know everybody's going to come say, hey, right? Absolutely, and celebrate with you, so we're so glad that you're here this morning. Man, God is doing some great things, and again, let me encourage you, be thinking, who can I invite next Sunday, Easter Sunday, all right? Man, again, as Caleb said earlier, this is a Sunday that people might be more open to coming with you. So invite them to come. We got a breakfast beforehand at 915, all right? Tell them you'll take them out to lunch afterwards or invite them back to your house for lunch, right? But, but man, just, just invite people. Invite people. You never know. They might say no, but they just might say yes, right? Let's pray for them to hear the gospel. We're praying for all those ones that people have written down on cards and said they're being intentional to invite. Also, don't forget about Maundy Thursday this week. So we have a special service here on Thursday night um, commemorating the night that Jesus washed his disciples' feet and had the last supper with them before his crucifixion going into uh, Good Friday. So come be a part of that. That starts at 6. But we're also going to have a meal at five, beginning at 5 o'clock, but come whenever you can. Um, we'll have a meal before then to come and join us. You can sign up for that through the church newsletter. And, uh, and I believe the students are going to have an awesome ice cream party afterwards, right? So come. That's right. That's right. That's great. So students, come on out for that, too. That's going to be good. So, but what a great week. I just want to encourage you this week. Focus your heart on what Christ did 2,000 years ago this week. Prepare your hearts to celebrate what he accomplished in the cross. And come next Sunday, the glorious resurrection. Church, we who were once without hope now have a hope and a future because he is risen. Amen? Walk in that truth this week. We'll see you Thursday night. No Wednesday night this week. Thursday night. Have a great